back when Craig and I were really chasing resources, uh, young, youngish believers, both young ministers trying to help people chasing the resources. Man, where, where's God? How do we tap into his ability to heal human lives? I remember Craig went to a conference and uh, I was very curious to hear when he got back, well, how'd it go? What'd you learn? And, and he's like, well, you could see the tension and you could hear the hesitation in his voice. He says the teaching was phenomenal. And I didn't want to go to dinner with any of those people. And he's like, something's wrong with that. Mm. Something's wrong with that picture. Like, what's with that? Like, the teaching was incredible. And none of these people were attractive, like, to the extent that I would want to go spend time with them. Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Heart Podcast. This is John and Morgan Part two of a conversation we're having about an unnecessary tension between soul and spirit that has really divided the church and, and kept a lot of good people from a lot of helpful resources on both sides of the, of the equation there. And I had said last time that I'm going to start opening the Ransom Heart podcast every time by saying, look, this is a very gnarly, gnarly hour on the earth to be human. Uh, the conditions that, that we are all living in are violent on the soul. And by that, I mean everything from, you know, the social conditions uh, to human brokenness to the demonic and to the evil unleashed on the earth, just the whole thing, the whole situation we find ourselves in is violent on the soul. It's a very difficult time to thrive. And God cares deeply about all that, cares deeply about your humanity. And therefore, maturity is not an option. You can't dink around with your life and find life or sustain it, uh, find love or sustain it, find relationship or sustain it. You can't. You can't dink around. Maturity is not an option. Maturity is your rescue and wholeheartedness is your safe place. We, we, we are pushing into wholeheartedness not because we're particularly you know, attracted to it, on its own, because it's our thing, but because we want life and God and everything we can find this side of heaven, and, and you just quickly learn these things are not optional. So what we set up last time was a, a tension um, between supernatural resources of the kingdom of God to heal human lives, human souls, human marriages, parenting problems, children with anxiety issues, you know, all of that, just with the broken human condition versus what we would sort of call like process resources of Christianity, whether that's spiritual disciplines or spiritual direction or scripture memory or conventional uh, counseling and, and Christian therapy. There really needs to be no tension between the two, because as we were pointing out in Paul's life and Peter's life and and others, you see both. You you see both in the in the scriptures. What what we're trying to chase down is what are the resources of the kingdom of God to help heal human lives in this hour, in this very difficult hour. And unfortunately, we've all had an experience. We've all had. You know, somebody we've run into, Craig's, you know, experience of going to this conference. And it's actually, a, it's a really fair question. You know, you spend time with someone who's amazing. You know, they either know tons, you know, about the scriptures or they've had amazing encounters with God. or they, they prophetic words to speak over your life. Yeah, they've got, they don't even know you and they've got words yes. to speak over your life that are totally accurate or they're just unbelievably brilliant on the soul and they just ask all the right questions. But then you walk away and you say, yeah, but I, I don't want to go camping with that person. <laughs> it's very telling. Like that's an issue. And, and the issue is, unfortunately, the resources of the kingdom of God come through people and they come through institutions and they come through spokesmen just like us. And oftentimes that stained glass isn't so pretty. 
<laughs> it's more staining than what are you glass. About the way I look. No, no, no. I'm just saying <laughs> it's getting filtered. Yes. Like it gets filtered through people who have big hair or yell or <laughs> or don't have a sense of humor or you know. And then you go, "Wow, I'm just not interested mm-hmm. in that." We're just introducing a conversation here. We're just giving you a category to think about in your own search for answers in your life and in the lives of those you love and care about. Where do I find the resources of the kingdom? And I think it would be really helpful to note at the top of this one is to say there is culture and there is kingdom. There is various expressions Mm -hmm. of Christian culture and then there is the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And they're not the same thing. Right. And in every expression of the kingdom, there is culture, right? You can't get away from it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's big belt buckles and cowboy boots <laughs> and a twang. And, and if you're not into that stuff, you go, ew, you know, and you walk away from what may be a resource that's there that could be really helpful to you. And or you're drawn, you know, or you're drawn to a culture. Right, and then you miss all the other gold yeah. that's outside of where you're familiar. So it's really helpful to just say, look, there's a vast difference between the kingdom of God and the means by which it is being expressed on the earth. Let me say it again. There's a vast difference between what the kingdom of God actually is and how beautiful and powerful and filled with resources it is and the current expressions of it on the earth right now, you know, because it's coming through broken people and broken systems and things that are very enculturated. And so I also want to say to the idea of some things are just not optional, liturgy versus fog machines and rock music. (laughs) That's good example. Um, I know this can be hard for you to hear, but those are frankly optional. Those are actually culture. There are people that are drawn to quiet and contemplative, and there are people that are drawn to rowdy and loud. And so they're going to go find their people, and they're going to create a thing, and that thing is going to become church for them, right? But God isn't in the loud, and he actually isn't in the quiet necessarily. He might be in both. Those things are cultural expressions born out of people's earnest desires to live out what they Mm -hmm. think is their peace that they found in the kingdom. And that's okay, but don't let the culture throw you if you're not drawn to that. Right. And in those examples, what I appreciate, you know, I have a good friend that has that culture of loud and rock music, and their mission, which they are anointed to do, is to be a safe place for hurting people that have been hurt by religion, right? And so they're kind of doorway is you're loved, you're safe, your story is safe here. Then there's a whole other group in the liturgical environment. They are anointed to bring people into the reality that this didn't begin with you. It doesn't end with you, that you're part of a story that's ongoing, that's not up to you to generate your own spirituality. So what I appreciate in both those stories, John, we can be so turned off by the thing that's not us. But when we understand that it's the kingdom moving through the things and in humility in both of those instances and often moving through both of those things, then how can we make ourselves more accessible to the kingdom in its fullness and through every expression? So what what we're after are all of the resources Mm -hmm. available to us in this hour where people are so hard-pressed, families are hard-pressed, kids are so hard-pressed, and we are broken, and you're vulnerable to the forces of evil. So we want to find everything we can of God in order to be wholehearted Mm -hmm. and to grow in our maturity and to advance his kingdom Mm -hmm. to others. We want that. And there's this tension of, yeah, some people are looking for his resources to come in a moment, and in a supernatural expression, and there are others who are looking for his resources to come over time and through process. And what we're saying is, if gosh, if you look at the scriptures, both are there and not to the exclusion of the other. We saw it in Paul's Hmm. life. You have the Damascus Road, and then you have the 14 hidden years. You've got it in Peter's life, and, you know, you have his encounter with Jesus, but then he walked with Jesus for three years. He had daily conversational discipleship with Jesus over time. It didn't all get done Mm -hmm. 
in a moment, in a flash, in an encounter. And what's really sad is if you exclude one side of the road, you are going to miss out on the resources you need Mm -hmm. because it doesn't all get done in a moment. If you just run from conference to conference, church to church, looking for the next encounter, it will be insufficient to deal with all of the things going on within your soul and your world. It just will. And then beyond your own story, you propagate whatever gospel you've come to believe, right? So you then are offering an insufficient gospel. So you're offering a gospel that's missing significant pieces that in time can actually do harm. That's huge. On the other hand, you know, back to the woman, we were using a hypothetical scenario last time of a woman who had been a year and a half in counseling and struggling with some childhood trauma issues and was not getting the breakthrough she needed. You know, if she doesn't look around for the other resources available to her, like deliverance, like dealing with the actual presence of spiritual darkness in her life, she probably won't get whole. Mm. And that's just why I'm saying maturity is not an option, gang. You, you can't just say, well, I choose to live with God in this way, and that's it. I'm yep. not interested in the rest. And go, well, then you're going you're gonna to be hamstrung. You're going to be hampered, seriously hindered, maybe thwarted in your pursuit of God because we can't live without the fullness of the resources of the kingdom of heaven made available to us in this hour. So can I ask you a question? A how-to question. What next? Like, in your story, John, as I observe, these dimensions of the gospel in which you live in now didn't come all at once. They came in parts and pieces in different seasons. I remember you taking me to Denver to see some Yoda kind of spiritual warfare dude, and I trusted you. So I went— But it was this weird spiritual warfare thing, and you were a scribe, which at the time I thought, like, those were old people with pointy hats that wrote on parchment. Like, what is a scribe, right? You were actually just going as a friend to take notes. Yeah, just taking notes. It was was this spiritual warfare piece in which you were being trained. So just that by way of example, help us understand through your story, like, how do you begin to venture into these areas that are unknown or unfamiliar or places that we've been hurt before or just simply wacky? Like, what, what do you do next? Well, I think I want to proceed with the assumption that God is always at work. And so what is he bringing into your life? What, what is he inviting you into? He is always inviting us out of our comfort zones, apart from times of solace, mercy, you know, sort of a a cocoon of protection. Yes, yes, yes. There's those two because we do need those. But for the most part, we are being invited out. I just say, what's he doing? Who's he bringing into your life? What hurts? Because Lewis's quote, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You know, the the sad thing is most of us don't change until there's pain. Mm. You know, we think our marriage is fine until our spouse tells us it isn't. And then we realize what a selfish human being we are, and we actually do have to change, and um, we think our family's fine until our kid turns up pregnant or tells us they hate God or doesn't want anything to do with church anymore, and you go, oh, wait, maybe I'm not parenting with all the resources I thought I had, and I need to look into this, Mm -hmm. right? So what's God doing? But this is actually how we went back and we looked at two things. We looked at what works. Mm -hmm. We're very, very practical people. What works? And what do we see operating in the Gospels? Are those things consistent? And this was where the phrase that we kind of throw around here, you know, we have our culture, and so we have a phrase, and we call it the four streams. But as we looked at the way Jesus dealt with people in the Gospels, how he interacted with human beings towards their restoration, we see healing, no question. We see counseling, we see deliverance, and we see discipleship. And what's interesting is to our encounter and to our process of those, you know, sometimes it is a healing moment. It's a healing touch. It's Christ reaching out to someone and the leper, after the Sermon on the Mount, this man with uh, some skin condition runs up to Jesus. And, you know, in that culture, Jesus cannot, cannot, cannot 
cannot touch this guy. It is literally against the law, but it's also against everybody's view of Jesus mm-hmm. and whether they're going to believe him or not, you know, respect him or not. And Jesus touches him. He heals him physically, but he heals him emotionally, yes. right? Because this man has not been touched ever since, you know, he got ill and Christ does it and he does it publicly. And it's just this incredibly beautiful one moment encounter with Jesus that's life changing, right? Or you get the story when Mary Magdalene is introduced in the scriptures, it says, She out of whom Jesus cast seven demons. So there it is. She didn't need counseling only. Apparently, she needed deliverance. And Jesus just simply kicked the demons out. Like, and like we say, you can't counsel out a demon, yeah, right? You can't. You can't reason with a demon either. They just have to be banished. And so you see these one-time life-changing encounters with Jesus, but you also see process throughout the scriptures, you know. And finally, towards the end of his life, Paul's writing to the church, and he says, the things that you have seen me practice mm-hmm. put into practice, Mm -hmm. and the God of all peace will be with you. So he's describing process. And so we would say it depends on the need, Mm -hmm. and it depends on the moment. But you clearly see the presence of God to heal not just bodies but souls. You clearly see deliverance, the need to break Mm -hmm. the chains of darkness in various places in our lives, you know, not just once, but over time in different scenarios, you see counseling, you see the need. Jesus engages people's hearts. He engages people's hearts and gets into their story. He does it all the time. The woman at the well, the man at the pool of Bethesda, you know, Simon on the beach, just the long process, you know, long obedience in the same direction. In Peterson's words, you just see discipleship. You just see you've got to walk this out over time. So the the Exodus story is both history and very, very important and instructive history, but it is also allegory. It is, it is the great allegory for the salvation of the people of God, right? Um, that we were once under bondage to the kingdom of darkness and we have been rescued and into the kingdom of God and, and all of that. But I think it is also important allegory for the transformation of individual lives and souls, the ground that you want to take in your life, right? The, the real estate, the breakthrough that you're looking for. And so listen to what he says. God is promising Israel that he is going to do this And they've seen a bunch, but more is needed. And so here's what he says. He says, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every enemy you encounter. I will make your enemies turn their backs and run. Okay? But listen to what he says next. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. So God is promising mighty things, and he has already done mighty things. Supernatural, God is here, moving powerfully things. But he's also saying, and I'm not going to do it all at once. Why? Because you are not ready to handle that level of freedom and that amount of real estate. Like, you just can't take all that ground in a day. Not in reality and and not in the human soul, right? Do you see that? Yep, and that's where we even see the pattern, you know, in a lot of our dear allies that that bend towards the supernatural encounters is seeking after encounter after encounter and never get to maturation, right? They never get to the process of becoming the kind of person that can be entrusted with more. But in that passage, I'm reminded, John, that we're being trained to rule, right? We're, we're being prepared to reign. Yes. It's all, much of the work of the kingdom is preparation, yes. right? And so it shortcuts the process. Yes. And so we often use the phrase little by little and all at once, that both are true, little by little and all at once. Yes. Yeah. And I, I don't like it. I would love for it to be all at once. Yes. Um, I'm a battlefield medic, 
kind of guy personally, and I like to get in there and get people stitched up and get them back in the fight. Mm -hmm. Let's go, you know, now. But with that scripture and a thousand others, with the example of Paul's life and others, you just see there is this over-timeness as well. All we're trying to do in this podcast is just to say, look, we need the resources of the kingdom of God available to his people right now for our wholeness because the hour demands it. I mean, it's not an option. And you got to be open mm-hmm. to all of the resources available. And so if, if you're an encounter type person, you probably need to go to a year of counseling. Mm-hmm. And if you're a spiritual direction type person or, you know, you're into the spiritual disciplines or scripture memory, that kind of thing, you probably actually need some supernatural encounters in your mm-hmm. life. You need more of the presence of God, right. not just his principles. Right. And right? both of them are applications of the same thing that we're saying we're going to take risks, right? We're trying to trust God beyond our own understanding yes. to say, I want more of God. And I think what it surfaces for me, John, is we all have limits we've placed on God. We have limits on who he can be, what he can do, and how he can do it. And so one of the things that we've learned that's just been so helpful because we see the fruit is I begin with confessing I have placed limits, both known and unknown, on who you can be, what you can do, and how you can do it. And so, God, I ask for your forgiveness, and I repent, and I break those limits that I've placed because those limits actually work we are given authority, and we actually can block the power of God moving in our life, right? Yeah. And so to break those limits is to and, be and open. Gang, gang, hang on. If that just freaked you out, I just need to intervene and say the Scripture says that, right? Jesus was able to do no miracles among them because of their unbelief. And I want more of God beyond my current belief system, Amen. right? I limit him. Yep. And so I want to break yep. those limits I've placed. And an example, you know, I sought out some healing. I, I mean, I've done the work over time for deeper healing, deeper integration, deeper union, deeper maturation, and it got me to a place that I was then ready for the next step of massive healing that I've not yet received, yes. right? It was earlier this year, and, and I sought out um, through both wisdom and revelation, and it's a beautiful story of working with counsel of trusted people and asking God, genuinely wanting to hear revelation. I ended up participating in, in, a, in a program, and it was, it was a little outside the realm of what I'm used to. It was a little bit, it was a lot outside the realm of the modalities that I have been um, operating with mostly in the last decade. And mm. at the same time, It was borrowing from the same river of life, from the same kingdom of heaven. Mm. And what I appreciate about it is I wasn't willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yes. I was willing to step into an area and with a filter and in Christ and a lot of intercession over my life to say, okay, I'm going to stay protected. And at the same time, I I don't even know what I don't know. Mm. I want more of God. And so I'm going to Mm. open myself up to the more. And I can tell you, it was one of the most transformational experiences of my life. Yeah. It took risking. Yes. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. The point isn't, oh, okay, let's find out what, you know, John and Morgan are doing and, and who they're seeing, you know, this year because those resources may not be appropriate to, frankly, your need or even available right now. Uh, they might be booked. And that beautiful man in, in Denver that I took Morgan to years ago is passed on into the kingdom of heaven, so he's not available. <laughs> um, the point is, ask, seek, knock. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, what do you have? I recognize that I am an unfinished man or an unfinished woman. There are things in me that need Uh, You're growing and healing and maturing. I want that. I want wholeheartedness. Please shepherd me. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus, shepherd me in this. And where have I thrown up obstacles? What am I not open to? Right. Jesus. (laughs) Am I willing to let trial and error be part of the equation, exactly. right? Because it's messy. Yep. There are setbacks, yep. right? You will bump into things. It's Proverbs 14.4. You know, when the oxen are present, the manger 
is not empty. Yeah, it's messy. Right? You want life? Yep. You're going to have some other stuff that goes along with life yeah. in the barn. Yep. But we want life. Yep. We want more. Yeah. So we just needed to name this unnecessary tension between two sort of groups, the people that we run into that are chasing encounters and the people that we run into that are trying the next process and say, whoa, 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 hang on. Those are all pieces of the kingdom of God. And at different points in your story, you might need to swap lanes. <laughs> you, you might need to get out of your current modality and, and go get some more resources, right, uh, than the ones that, that you are uh, either just aware of or inclined to or kind of drawn to the culture of. Uh, get outside that so that you can tap into what we need for this hour on the earth where it's hard to be human. It's hard to be well. Gang, I, I hope you hear this is offered in love. This is not a scolding. This is an invitation. Just ask, seek, knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. You've been listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast, John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder ending a two-part conversation. Uh, about an unnecessary tension between soul and spirit and tapping into everything we can find of the kingdom of God. <laughs>